This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Doll, episode number 232. I don't know how we've done it, but we have managed to do it, Timothy. It's what we do. Yes, we have. Um, yeah, and here we are heading into the holiday uh, winter <laughs> solstice. Well, it finally zone. got a little chilly here, which I, of course, enjoy. As you can tell, I'm just sitting here in a slip in a red bra for my Christmas, uh, pre-Christmas present to you. Whoa, oh boy. Whoa. 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 Hey, hey. By the way, I know you're going to enjoy this little tale. I mean, it's, it's okay. kind of tragic, but you know, I've spoken about this before, you know, it's one of my favorite subjects, cracking a, cracking a dick. No oh boy. But be warned, man, because doctors say you're more likely to fracture your penis at Christmas time. What? What's that about? Medics analyzed hospital data of more than 3,000 men who suffered the injury and the daily incidents of fractures just go up over Christmas. Now, it was German medics that discovered the rates of this eye-watering injury spike oh, over God. the festive period. Now, although we know that the penis, unfortunately, is not really a bone. <laughs> but <it laughs> unfortunately, can, why does that matter? Well... It does to some of us, All but right. it can fracture when the appendage is subject to blunt force. And yeah. usually, as I have stated, it will then possibly resemble an, an eggplant. Now, such injuries usually <laughs> typically occur during vigorous sex with positions like a uh, doggy style or cowgirl, which seem to present the biggest risk. Um, now, I don't know why. I guess because over Christmas, like you're so sick of your family, you just want to, you know, fuck the pain away, as <laughs> Peaches once said. Oh, but uh, there is a warning going out. I mean, I don't know whether I'm warning men or or uh, telling women that it is possible to crack a dick. Now, those that have actually had their dicks cracked, yeah, Merry Christmas, oh, motherfucker. God. They've often been traumatized and then develop erectile dysfunction and or, or a lifetime of painful sex. I mean, it's, you know, it, it can occasionally. I mean, because what happens is that blood is flowing into it and that runs along the penis and it makes it hard to get an erection after it's been cracked. So the trick to stopping penile injuries is to thrust quite shallowly, according to sex experts. <laughs> Well, good luck on that one. Well, I heard it also when it, when it cracks, it's kind of like um when you try to break the branch of a really oh yeah ri ripe and it's alive loud. tree, it's kind of splinters a little bit, but it's it, so blood goes yeah. everywhere. And, you know, if you get a, a preopism, which is a, an erection that won't go down, which gets very painful after a few hours. Oh, um, so, you know, I've yet to experience that, but I'd love to. But yeah, I hear you. Yeah, well, uh, I just, go ahead. And keeping on the same subject, and I I, I don't want to get although I am very personal, uh, if you have, which I, I, I assume you do, two functioning testes, well, by <laughs> yeah. the time I finish saying the sentence, you'll have probably produce 50,000 sperm cells. That's around 300 million sperm cells per day. And if you don't ejaculate frequently, well, where do they go? And is it healthier to regularly release them into the world? Well, I think, it yeah, is. So, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, from the Institute of Human Anatomy, the lead dissector, Jonathan Benin, he says that, you know, sperm production, storage, and of course, the common question he gets from students is what happens to sperm cells if they are not released? Well, he's been investigating this and he showed <laughs> that the high frequency of ejaculations, that would be like 21 times a month, almost every day. It correlated with a 20% reduction in prostate cancer, Interesting. right? Yeah. Which is better than just ejaculating four to seven times a month. But okay, I'm just saying, do yourself because uh, I, I only have two hands. What am I you're pro, well, you're pro sex, but you're definitely a pro masturbation. And uh, well, Queen of such at this point, I which, would say, yeah. which will lead us into my story. Which, which will lead us. <laughs> Christina Revels Glick. Ended her life after like a nine a nine month spiral downwards after she was arrested uh, for masturbating oh, with yeah. a dildo on, on a beach off of Savannah, Georgia. Well, I mean, look, I'm all for 
the masturbation with whatever form, but not on a freaking public page. Well, she claims when the way, of course, the reason why it's so devastating because it was cops with body cams. And then, of course, it went viral. It was humiliating to her. She claims she thought no one was around, but a family happened to see it or walk by. I mean, bring a bring a bring a vibrator to the beach. I mean, it was yeah. like pretty, pretty bold. It's funny, actually. I mean, what the hell? I mean, look, you're going to the beach. Why are you bringing a goddamn dildo? I don't get it, but whatever. Well, you know, well I don't know if you remember, Lydia, last time we were in Los Angeles together um, and you had to go into a store and I said, and you came back and go, Lydia, now I have seen this many times with like crazy men, like, like you know, homeless guys in the subway masturbating. He's going to walk away. But I had, I had never seen until this moment a woman really going to town on her pussy like and it wasn't just it wasn't just like kind of quickly rubbing her clip well, who was doing that are you saying that was me? Cra- no 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 you oh. <laughs> i i had the car and we had to go to a store yeah you said i had to run an errand so i was just sitting in the in the parking lot while you just started in and out in five minutes and i'm like i see this gest this motion it was in a car too but the door, door was wide open oh yeah and, okay. and it wasn't like a quick little like scratch in the record kind of movement cool. it was a okay. full elbow grease you know scrubbing the decks kind of like the shoulder <laughs> was in it and she was going crazy i was like am i am i seeing this i go i am what is she doing i mean i think she's probably on meth or something but yeah that was a ladies well, uh, in public you know, that's the thing uh, i guess just, now you know i'm I was a little shocked at first because I thought you might be incriminate. Face it, I'm not going to be doing it in a, in a parking lot. Didn't that happen once in a hotel where like your window opened and you were in the middle of an act and people like saw oh, you? Yeah, <laughs> well, we, you know, we'll, we'll go into that later. Excuse yeah, me, not the window. The door blew open and there was a man thinking that someone was being murdered. It was just me killing off my sexual killing off your own sperm really releasing your own sperm well you know i don't want to get prostate cancer any more than the next right so uh, kind of on the same subject i don't know if you've ever been exposed to the concept of the aztec death whistle nope no i I don't know it's one of the scariest most bone rattling sounds ever so 25 years ago archaeologists were they were excavating some pyramids in mexico city and they found the skeleton of a 20 year old man who had been sacrificed around the 16th century. And in his hands were two curious whistles that were decorated with the face of skulls. So these musical devices were called an Aztec death whistle. And supposedly they're just absolutely the most terrifying thing because it, they're like skulls and they are a whistle. And the Aztecs used uh, them in battle to mimic the agonizing cries of sacrificial victims as their living hearts were torn from their chest. So there is, of course, a popular video clip um, which conjures the blood chilling sounds from an oversized death whistle. But the sober truth is is we know very little about how the Aztecs really use these intriguing instruments. But look, Aztecs, I mean, one thing, you know, being as we both are connoisseurs of hot peppers, chili sauces, <laughs> anything spicy. I know from researching for my cookbook that the, both the Aztecs and the Mayans would have bonfires of jalapenos and habaneros. And Ooh. if the children were naughty, they'd hold them over the smoke. Oh, God. I mean, that fucking oh, your lungs uh, terribly. Oh. Yeah, well, we know that the Aztecs had some very strange and unusual rituals. R- rituals. Places. Well, speaking of rituals, the the very <laughs> com- the very common and and regular ritual of a funeral, Shane McGowan's uh, funeral, uh, and that was in his will that he was paying for the open bar, so he ten thousand uh, dollars to the to the open bar at his uh, funeral. Yeah. Of course. Of course, his wife says, I don't want this to be misrepresented. That wasn't his last words. His last words were peace and love in the world, Um, which, you know, I guess if you're. I mean, it's amazing he didn't die a lot sooner. Well, that's that's kind of amazing. Extreme lifestyle and alcoholism and just uh, extreme behaviors. I mean, he held on quite long, if you ask me. So the antithesis of peace and love in the world is hate and war, hate, hate and war in the world. So with all the attention and all the atrocities going on right now, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Israel, which, you know, these things should be talked about. I'd like to also talk about other ones that are not talked about just to kind of like bring this to the attention. 
but the, and I've been looking at these things, but the, I'm going to focus on one, which really blew my mind, especially with all this talk about immigration and the wall. Oh. Yeah, it's especially been, from the biggest mouth that married two immigrants. Hello. Ba- ba- basically, I mean, since the, the modern drug war in Mexico, basically once they started right. doing all the, the main trafficking in the United States, the infighting, the Gulf cartel, uh, Los Cetas and all that stuff. I didn't realize this. The amount of deaths related to this is estimated. The amount of deaths related to? to, the, to, to the, the, since 2006, the, the, the basically Mexican drug wars are going on right. Our neighbors. You know, people are talking about all this stuff going around the world. These are our fucking neighbors. Yeah. Well. 350,000 to 400,000 people have been fucking killed. And and so people and then people are like, oh, these people are coming, crossing our borders and all this stuff. Uh, unless it's discussed about uh, discussed about who is buying uh, the, the drugs that are making this a war and um, and and a market in itself, you're, you're not going to be honest about any of this stuff. And yeah. instead, what we're doing is we're, we're picking on people, desperate families, people who are trying to well, leave. Uh, from- we're, yeah, yeah. we're picking on them, and we will never breach the conversation about our no. participation in this fucking thing. And, right. and this well, is what's like- interesting is, I don't know if you read that, like Switzerland is considering, wisely enough, legalizing cocaine. Now, yeah, well, they, yeah, they legalize everything, marijuana, yeah. but really, the Mexican cartels are basically cocaine based yeah which is yeah. causing a lot of these deaths which is causing all just a lot of corruption which is causing the death of not only people they force into or that don't agree with them or the police who cannot control them or etc you know the drug wars never worked are not working and starting with just legalizing marijuana. Well, okay, good good point. But most of that is grown, you know, a lot of that's grown in Humboldt County anyway. So whatever. And what, what's up with the, the new avocado wars that are going on with the, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. the cartel? I mean, uh, anyhow, um, well, as you say, the war is never over. I mean, inner city violence, all that stuff. It's, 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 the it's, war it's, is never over, especially when 174 out of 194 countries are in conflict. So I mean, the thing is, again, what does it always boil down to in this time of peace and love during the holiday season? Good luck with your fucking families. I hope there's peace and love amongst them because often there isn't. I'm just saying wars are not going to end until the patriarchy in positions of power, which are basically 30 to 80 year old old men, corporate funded, corporate based puppets who only are interested in either land, whatever God, oil or now rare earth minerals, is readdressed and equilibrium is had. And it will not be. So just get used to it, people. And this is why I am an apocalyptician. It is the same as it ever was. And that's why I insist upon pleasure as the ultimate rebellion in these times, as all times, of universal frickin' strife. It isn't just Israel and Gaza. It isn't just Ukraine and Russia. There are so many other places of great descent, of increasing poverty, of, in America, increasing homelessness, et cetera, that the, 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 the issues are so huge that at least when night falls, take some time out and appreciate what you do fucking have and love the one you're with or the one you'd like to be with if they can accept that love and if they can't find somebody else who can. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch. Tim Dahl. And you know what? Happy holidays. Good luck on that one. Because every day is a holiday in my life. Yes. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Roddy Bottoms. Hello, my new friend good to meet you I Hi, know it's good to see you how are you i wish everyone could see us they don't get to see us on this podcast right well it's just- they will soon when we start charging them for the video exports no problem and they'll know well, how gorgeous we all are i know we look amazing <laughs> people don't know what how they're do doing out there how do we do it i don't know mostly just like you know lives well led you know I think it's the happiness factor, which people don't yeah. realize what a chuckle fucker I am. Well, you, you also, as you say, pleasure is the ultimate rebellion. And I guess it's uh, 
if you can get away with uh, taking it to the edge and keep the pleasure going, then that's good. I guess when the, the pleasure feedbacks and turns into no pleasure, I guess that's where you can get into a little. Trouble. Well, that's for other people's problems. <laughs> but Rowdy, that kind of brings us to your new trip, which is Man on Man, which is about pleasure, which is about, you know, breaking down the barriers between the, you know, homophobia, fatophobia. And I love also the fact that on your website, you have, and you have an invite for pen pals. Oh, yeah, it was a program that we did. We tried to approach it like, I mean, it took a long time to sort of get into sort of the realm of like what we were comfortable doing. Like it started out, the van just started as this weird sort of like right at the start of COVID. Joey and I had been going out together for like a couple months and it was just fucked up dark time. I mean, we were all there, but it was like. My mom got really sick. Joey's mom had just passed away. Like COVID was happening and no one knew what the fuck was going on. And in New York, it was so scary. It was, it was. Those days was, I mean, remember those tents that they were putting up? Oh, yeah. like, well, 30, 36,000 people died in New York in two months. Yeah. And, 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 I'm, and I was here during 9-11 and 3,000, you know, not to dismiss, uh, died. And the whole country was we all stand by New York. We're New Yorkers. And it, it got so polarized that 36,000 people died in two months. Everyone's like, fuck them. And like, it was just so insane. Well, and, and it also reminds us of, you know, the really horrible pandemic in the late 70s, early 80s, in a sense. Yeah, full on. I mean, we'll go, it all kind of comes around to that. But like at that time, like, I mean, the scary thing for us was like no one knew. No one, we we didn't know what was going on. No one knew how many people. Like I was watching Rachel Maddow, and I was like, she is being fucking alarmist, just like Rachel Maddow does. Like it's not going to get worse. And then it just kept getting worse. Then in this crazy in this crazy time, Joey and I just decided to like, we thought like it was best to like get out of New York, um, just because it felt like two less people in New York would be good. And then my mom was really sick. So my sisters were kind of taking care of her. So we drove across the country in this big white truck. And um, were you picking of, things up along the way? Just nothing. Cause like we, know, we, we didn't know what to do. Like we would stop for gas and we would use like, you know, the paper napkins out in the like gas station things to like touch the handle with. And we wouldn't go into the stores and we wouldn't stay in hotels. It was just scary as hell. Well, and did it work at that time for you? I mean, pretty much. I mean, we, uh, yeah, I didn't get COVID at that point. But anyway, it's a long story, but on the way across the country, we started talking about like, we knew we'd have to quarantine for a while. So we were like, let's do, uh, might as well be productive. I mean, it was like this special time in which like we had to stay inside and do nothing. So we just kind of like got like a microphone sent to us where we were going to in California and Joey had his guitar in the back seat, and we had a piano at the place that we stayed that I kind of grew up playing. So it was kind of poetic and weird in that way. And we just, um, though we're both musicians, we'd never made music together. And we just kind of started, like just to find a safe place, we just started writing songs together. And we didn't have any design of making a record or anything like that. We just like thought like, let's just do this just to kind of stay sane. So we started just kind of like, I mean, we hadn't been going out that long. So we were like, pretty much like smitten with each other, you know? So Which we is started- such a great like, like, It's such a great place to be. Yeah. So it was like really intense love songs. We just started writing back and forth. And then we made a goofy video, like us in our underwear and stuff and fucking around and being kind of. What cake. was your what was your first video that you did? It's a uh, first song called Daddy. And we just made it with our iPhone and us in underwear, just kind of like grinding and stuff. And we put out this video and it right away, like kind of like people started watching it and it really kind of took off. And then in a crazy thing, like YouTube took it down and cited that it was like, um, you know, illicit behavior and kind of against their guidelines, which was fucked. And then Rolling Stone magazine somehow got wind of that and kind of like got on board. And then it kind of did it this more probably more help than than harm. But it was a an old school, an old school uptight censorship. Yeah. Uh, kind of well wow, you don't really see that with rock and roll or that much anymore but uh but... it's fun like get be put something out in a queer way and you'll 
you'll see it real fast. But in that way, it was sort of fun. Like, you know, like back when we were younger, when people would like fuck with us and try and censor us, it like really energized us. Right, you know? right. And in that way, we were like, oh, fuck no. And we really leaned into like, you're not going to fucking censor us. And we really like leaned into the sort of the politics of what we were doing. And just like, when from that point on, we'd like, let's be as fucking gay and in your face as we can and take that fuckers. And it's, it's what I like to consider punch rock right in your motherfucking face. It ain't punk rock, it's punch rock. And here we go. That was one of your songs. I was looking at some of your videos, cruising through them. And the one that I found really hilarious is, is it, uh, correct me if I'm misquoted, is it called It's Fun to Be Gay? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's so fun to be gay. It was sort of like, I mean, my concept for that song is just sort of like straight up, like that was sort of like a reaction to sort of that, you know, um, censorship too. It's like, you know, we're just putting it like in people's faces. It meant to be, for me, it was sort of like more of a sarcastic sort of statement. Yeah. And I sure. kind of imagine making a, a video in which like it was all like AIDS deaths and like fucked up shit that queer people go through. Like, it's so fun to be gay. But Joey was not having it. He was like, no, we're not doing that. I think it was, I think you took a good direction on it. <laughs> yeah, it's I more do. like, I mean, it's kind of like community driven. And in that way, it's sort of, it feels like a good sort of summer kind of song. And, and I, I think that's really important, you know, to be, be to, to, to have the, com you know what the community is. It's We're all weirdos. So we have various communities that come together. And as you say on your website with that shout out for, for pen pals, I mean, look, we're not going away. We're here to motherfucking stay. Right. And, you know, there are circles within circles, or we like, as we like to call it, the connective tissue, but the weirdos will remain weird and we will not go the fuck away. Hello. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Good speaking point. of, speaking of uh, not going the fuck away, do you remember the first time someone tried to censor you? I guess as an artist or maybe even as a person, do you remember, was there like a rebellious, reaction that you didn't know you had inside of you they're like you know what i'm gonna really push this through I mean, maybe it was your parents telling you to like, go to bed or something like that i don't know but uh <laughs> no that's a good question i think kind of like you know when i grew up in los angeles and as a teenager in los angeles it's really kind of a it's a weird place to grow up amongst that culture you know where sure. it's hollywood and tan people and pretty people and growing up in that culture sort of uh, gave me a sort of edge to sort of not want to be that. So when I was 17 and I moved to San Francisco, uh, my friends and I were very all sort of provocative and confrontational. Or we like to say contrarian. You, you know, yeah, 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 for sure. That's what we were all about. Like it was all about like pissing people off. Like in any way we could do it, we would piss people off. And we got a lot of flack for that, you know, like being in bands and like fucking with people. Like I remember just like, yeah, getting a lot of shit for what we would do. Like we would like, uh, it was so uncool, but I remember like when we formed like the Faith No More band and we were playing shows, like early shows, I remember like we used to, as a band, we used to watch MTV, which was so uncool, but we would do it just because we wanted to fuck with people. And I remember playing, we played Jump by Van Halen. We played a cover of that. And people are just like, oh, that is so wrong. That is so, uh-uh, <laughs> don't, don't do that. But we were like, yeah, mm -hmm. fuck you, you know? I mean, well, Lydia does that herself. It, well, I hate Van Halen, but I did cover with Sylvia Black in a very sexy and even with a sitar way, Ain't Talking About Love for our future album that's coming out. Very oh, jazz wow. Yeah, oh, like, what, 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 I ain't talking about it. Love. My love is rotten to the core. I love cover songs, especially by people I hate. Well, well people also come to the uh, table assuming they know who she is. And when oh, Lydia does you. Oh, oh I. Uh, yes. And then when you whip out a Bon Jovi cover, people were like, what? Oh, and, I, and how about a Steely Dan cover? Because I like to cover the people I hated the most. And you know what? I use that as a Rorschach test because people are like, wait, I know this song, but. Oh, I used to fucking hate them. Yeah, well, now you like it. I'm going to send you some cover songs, Roddy. Let's see about that, baby. Because you covered one of the worst. I mean, Faith No More covered one of the worst fucking songs ever. Which Feeling. one was that? War Pigs or Easy? Oh, I cover Easy. I covered War Pigs. You covered War Pigs? So yeah, I mean, we did War Pigs at an early stage. I was not a rock kid. Like, I wasn't into that at all. But other what people were you into? Were. 
I was into like punk rock and just like anything that like hurt people's ears sort of more than like, you know, I wasn't into rock or like conventional sort of stuff like that. It really kind of pissed me off. But someone in the band wanted to do that. And he was like a really good guitar, guitar player. And it kind of became this thing that people really liked that we did war pigs. I don't, I didn't play on the song. Come to think of it. I, I would just play keyboards and there's no keyboards in that song. So I would just like leave the, I think I would do like a siren at the beginning of it. And then I would leave the stage, but then we did easy the Commodore song because oh, um, yeah. people sort of ex started expecting like war picks and they would be like, play the cover, play the cover. Yeah. Like, that, no, that, that is one of the worst songs ever. And yeah, I understand. But I mean, I, I, we have, we have a little bit too much in common. I did cover War Pigs. Weasel Walter played everything on it. We will send our different versions to each other. It's yeah. a, I mean, it's a pretty classic song. Like now well, I can. It's political, that, actually. Like, it's very fucking. Seven. Yeah, but you have very a but Roddy, Lydia's interpretation was a call and response. So she, she would take the the, the, the the Geezer Butler lyrics that Ozzy would sing, and then she'd be like, uh, like "Generals gather in their masses, uh, not my masses, bitches." You know, it was like this kind of like. Back There's and forth witches, herself. They're black men, not my witches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That kind of that kind of shit. It was almost like, uh, yeah, it was just commentary on the song in yeah, real I'm time. Always, I'm always talking out both sides of my mouth. I like it. So I mean, I mean, okay, you didn't grow up as a, as a rock kid, punk rock, but but then but because you're a keyboardist, because because originally you were doing more like what roll on analog, or, or you didn't know you had like an Obex or something. You had like I was looking at you had like an Oberheim, and then you went into some digital stuff. But what I'm getting at is you're kind of punk rock, but maybe more post punk rock. I mean, all the lush strings and all the synth sounds remind me more of post punk than punk, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was sort of part of what we were doing too. That was a weird sound to do. Like, otherwise, if you would remove like the keyboard elements from what Faith No More was as a band, it's like kind of just like a basic kind of like, I mean, an interesting hard rock band, but a hard rock band. And it was kind of cool to add keyboards into that because, again, it was a thing that was not very cool. And how do you make keyboards even look cool? Like me as a performer on stage, it's like, I hate keyboard players. There's nothing more boring than a person stuck at that like stationary place in a rock realm and like you can't really move and it like it never looks cool. So it was kind of a challenge to sort of like turn it into something that like not only changed the trajectory of what we were doing music wise, but also made kind of uh, it our own sort of or made it my own. I don't know. It was a weird thing. It was a it it it, it was a good position to be in the keyboard. Well, I, I think you did. I, I think by uh, in terms of visually the way you ended up doing it, which was kind of just traditional and ergonomically the correct way to do it as the solution as opposed to the break dance era or prog rock where they have the keyboards and these really ergonomically bizarre places just to add more drama because they're you're basically stationary or the keytar for instance. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, that that yes. really piss people off. <laughs> that thing, fuck yes. Up. So I mean, all right, that so just made my tits itchy. Even the thought of it made my tits itchy. So was Faith and Warren? I mean, are you, I'm, I correct. I'm correct because I, I, I don't know this. Are you a founding member, or you're just was it a, a, a everyone just kind of came together, or did you, were you like the person like I'm putting a band together? Like, how did it start? We uh, like Billy, the bass player, and I grew up together in Los Angeles, and we and the drummer started the band. And when we started the band, it was sort of this weird, freaky concept of like, it was just the three of us. And we kind of just started playing. Like all we would do is like, we called them loops. We would just do like a repetitive loop over and over. And we kind of like, it was our idea to have a different singer every time we played and different songs every time we played. So it was really kind of like a weird art concept at first. And then at some point we kind of settled on like a guitar player and then the song started sort of started to take a little bit more conventional sort of like or just like more like routine sort of way and we started playing the same songs over and over and then we got like a, a singer but like yeah the three of us kind of started the band yes so okay so you started without a guitar player initially and and the original drummer was is, is mike borden right the same the one the whole time correct yeah and and so uh he He's kind of a rocker because he went on to play with Ozzy, in fact. And yeah. and so he was cool with an idea of a synth bass drum trio, even though he was kind of a rocker. And then I guess, I don't know, you guys 
want a guitar at that point or or did that person kind of infiltrate yeah. I mean, it was a weird band. We weren't so rock when we started. It was the three of us. And we were like, I was saying, it was really kind of like art. And he was like, really like more into rhythm sort of stuff. Like he like, we were like into like weird shit, like last poets and like weird political stuff from the 70s. Sure. Yeah, we did all this. I don't know where we were like getting our information from, but we were just like, I don't know, weird kids. And then we got this guitar player and the guitar player really kind of skewed it into this rock direction. And he had really long hair and he played a flying V. And then PSC was friends with Metallica. So all of a sudden, like we had like these fans that were Metallica, like the actual band Metallica, like wearing our T-shirt. And somehow like it was like, I mean, it was identity crisis for me, but somehow we became this rock thing that like, I, that. It basically happened, I think, because like Jim was friends with the Metallica and the Metallica were on board. And then somehow we were like opening for Metallica at some point. We had all these Metallica sort of like, yeah, connections. It, it was weird. Yeah. You know, it's some, it's, wait, it's some things that, that I, uh, I often bring up that people don't realize. Sometimes success can be such a fluke. It doesn't necessarily mean anybody planned it. And it doesn't even mean that you can plan it. It's like what hits when is there's some mystery to it. I mean, yeah, there's machinery behind it at one point, but this is such a, a fluky concept that, that that happened. It's like, oh, uh, yeah, this guy likes and knows Metallica, and now their fans come. It's like, what? Yeah. I mean, it happens in the weirdest way. It's like, I don't know. We know so many musicians in our lives who never have success. Like, it always blows my mind that that band Faith No More, we were so weird. Like, I don't know why we ever got success. It is. It's crazy, elusive, and weird, and a mystery why it ever became a thing that it was. And, and what people were hooking into. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what, what do they think they're seeing? What What's their interpretation? Yeah. And does it matter whether it's right or not? Because, I mean... <laughs> You know, you're not taking a survey of what the fucking audience wants or what they think. I like but, to take one, but I don't. It's a mystery. Unless you're just a total musical sociopath, it's totally a mystery to the musicians itself, ourselves, um, why any of this is happening. Yusef Latif once told me that you ran into Wayne Shorter at a jazz fest and, and they were having that conversation. Wayne Shorter was like, I don't know why if I've had any more success in these other sax virtuosos. Yeah. Uh, don't know. Um, well, and Roddy, you just mentioned another c connection that we have because, you know, Tim and I, I mean, I uh, somehow summoned Umar bin Hassan and we did some shows with, speaking about Last Poets, this is madness. Uh, and yeah, oh, no, this is the highlight of my life. I'll talk to you more about that privately. Yeah, we did a show with Umar bin Hassan and Baba Tunde of the Last Poets. It was amazing. So I find it interesting. So the stepping stone is, you, you, first of all, and I'll say this, because not only... Two musicians not know why it happens when, when it happens there's other factors like you clearly weren't so rigid to obstruct this direction that you weren't anticipating like oh i'm not really a rock guy some people get so caught up in their tunnel vision they wouldn't even allow that channel to open up and so back to you were opening for metallica like how long had the band been in, in you know formation at that point faith no more I mean, at that point, we've been doing it for a while. Like we had one singer for like a couple records and we did a lot of touring with him and a lot of recording with him. Chuck was his name. And that was sort of a different sound. And then at one point we um, got a different singer, Mike Patton, who was like younger and like kind of better looking and white. And it's sort of like it was, I don't know, for whatever, for a math sort of like audience, it was an easier sell, I guess. And that's when, we, like at our third record, that's when we sort of started doing some shows with Metallica. But honestly, it didn't, it never really, it didn't pan out. It didn't, it seems like it was like a really good opportunity. Like at one point, like on our fourth record, we got this opportunity. They were like, uh, it was Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and they asked us to open like this long, long, long tour. And our record was just coming out. I was like, oh my God, yeah, this is like the opportunity of a lifetime. So exciting. But honestly, like at that point, they would sort of like, you know, measure the amount of records that were being sold after your concerts and stuff. And it, it wasn't working. Like people weren't liking us. Like, it, and we would play and like people would boo us and they didn't like us. So it's not like these opportunities were something that sort of like worked in the equation. No, uh, but it, it's, a it's a really good experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, 
it, good is sort of a loose term, but it was an experience. But people are what's so. We, what's weird is that you know just because people like the first band, you know, the headlining band and the middle band doesn't mean they're going to like the opening band, which is so weird. Like, give these fucking people a chance. Like, don't you understand why they're on the bill? Right. Like, and and it's often it's often what happens. Well, fa- fans fans of fans of mega bands have this cult yeah. thing so where where, where where they have this. I don't know. Never got got it. I like this band, and so therefore I have to hate these other bands. I mean, I'm talking about the mass masses. I never, never got that. I mean, Mark, we had Martin Rev from Suicide on here, and he, and they would open up for the Cars, and the same thing would happen, or or, or the Clash. They open for the Clash, and people were well, like, you know, that 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 both of those experiences were like to me ridiculous. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, come on, what do you think? It, this, it seems like I don't know. Does it seem to you, Lydia, that like people wouldn't like Suicide, like the Cars fans, or? Of course they wouldn't, because I mean the cars. I mean just because Rick Kasich liked it doesn't mean that their fans are going to like it. Their fans were pop fans, right. and again, speaking of suicide, you know that's one of the things I've been doing recently for the last few years in Europe is my tribute to suicide, doing the music of suicide in Ellen Vega, just to bring it back oh, yeah. as my first friends in New York, and because it's important and it's so much more violent the way that we, I and Mark Hurtado can do it now. That's so cool. Those were like the first people that you met in New York were like the are those guys, the suicide guys. They were the suicide. They hosted her. She was a teenager. They t- took her under their wings. Niacin. That's so amazing. Like, how did it come to pass that you met like uh Martin? Like, how did it how did it like I walked into Mexico, Kansas City and they were playing. That's how it happened. Wow. Just the way a lot of things do. And how Nobody did you, else, I mean, how did you get their attention? You're a young girl. You just I like, was very <laughs> obnoxious and aggressive, as you know, I still am. And I just walked up to him and said, "Oh my God, this is exactly why I'm here." That's fantastic. They didn't and have many fans at that time. But so, Roddy, I mean, you're saying it didn't really pan out, but at the same time, you did have steady rotation on MTV with a couple hits, and and you did I sell. Mean, it- a long it took a long time like we were get, we got popular for some reason in london first or in england first and um people over there really related to us in some way i think back then it was, seemed like an easy thing to do to sort of get attention in london and we did get a lot of attention and we started selling records there and i think at one point uh our record company in america which was slash uh who was kind of under the umbrella of like Warner Brothers or Reprise at the time, I think they felt silly because like we were having a lot of success in London and England. But couldn't do it, yeah. Not yeah, and it wasn't working in America. So they kind of like felt dumb. And I think it just took like, I think like a big wig in Warner Brothers like got our video on MTV. And that's when everything changed. And let's just talk about Slash for a minute because they were a great label. I mean, they were amazing. I mean, uh, Divine uh, Flesh Eaters, amazing. You know, they put out my album 1313. So many albums. They put out 1313 now. They did. Ruby Records, part of Slash. Oh, yeah. Slash put out a lot of great things and Ruby Records and Slash Magazine at that point. I mean, that the was germs. As, the first record they put out was the germs record. Yeah. I mean, they were as cool as you could get at that point, really. That but, I 13, mean, as 13 usual, record anything, is, that 13, anything 13 record weird. is so amazing. Do you love that record still? I do. I still love it. I mean, with that big, talk, I would, I would talk say some more after this. We're gonna, uh, Lydia, retrovi- with, with retrovirus, I think out of all retrovirus, I think you saw it uh, as her retrospective of her career, her discography, whatever. Is 1313 the album that we play the most songs out, off of? It, it has of previous, been, yeah. It I has think been. so. Yeah. Yeah. But I always love that song. Like Billy and I, like he was in Faith No More. And we, uh, three of us, when we had just formed Faith No More, we saw you play at, it was either on Broadway or Mabuhay Gardens in San Francisco. And um, it was on that record. And there was that song, you know, that song with the piano. I can't remember what's called. Oh, but it was like, uh, Dance of the Dead Children. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, we could not believe what we were seeing. Like, if you could have been a fly on the wall of our conversation after that, we were like, oh my fucking God. We were so smitten with you. It was like, well, hey, don't give it up, baby. We got more to talk about privately, I can tell. <laughs> it was so amazing, though, as like where we were in our lives and that performance was just like, I don't know why. It was just this pivotal 
thing. It was such a strong, like, did you have a relationship with San Francisco? Because it felt like just like everything. Well, look, no, so. actually, you grew up in L.A. and it's a very L.A. record because I when I when I did that record, when I lived there with Dick Stenny of the Weirdos, with Cliff Martinez, who was with right. um, Red Hot Chili Peppers and Captain Beefheart, et cetera, and does a lot of soundtrack. But it was really all about serial killers and the horror that is L.A. So you right. probably felt it in your bones, even if you didn't know exactly what I was saying. That's interesting. Did, did Cliff uh, uh, tour that with you or just record it? I mean, was he in the band? I, I mean, I, I don't know how many shows or what 1313 did. I, I, I can't remember. I think we did some shows. Yeah. It feels like that show, there was like maybe three people on stage. Like it was, yeah, pretty I, I don't remember. Out. Trust, trust on that. I don't remember. <laughs> all right. So, so man on man. So, all right, we're, we're going to go back to uh, where you are with that and this kind of post uh, sh shutdown <laughs> quarantine. Post yeah. Uh, so, where are you with it now? Did you just come back from Europe touring? Yeah. We just finished our, uh, a tour in Europe. We were over there for like almost two months. We just finished. <laughs> Which is where'd a you where'd you go? Where were the best shows? I mean, you know, kind of like it's hard to play like small cities. Like it's fun to play small cities because you get the feeling like people are really appreciative and like wow, they don't really get a lot of stuff. And it's fun to go there and to connect with people, but just in a making it work sort of financially, it's really hard to play. We played a lot of like shows like that where sometimes there was like thirty people in the audience. Well, that that's so, always that's and, always a good lesson to go back to though. Yeah, I mean, I you decided to go long. for two months. I yeah. mean, I could go for two weeks, three I weeks. Know. It was long. Trust me. I mean, I turned 60 a while ago and it felt like like, I don't know. I still feel like I have the energy to do it. And I never really got crazy tired, like doing this tour. But like it did feel like when I say that I'm 60 and I'm doing what I do because Joey and I do everything we had. Actually, someone was with us on this tour, but this was the first time we had someone like kind of. And, and traveling as a two piece is so much easier than traveling as a anything else piece. Yeah, completely. But we did a lot of shows. We played all over England for like probably three weeks. And then we did Europe, just kind of like traveling around. It's such a weird time to to uh, to tour, like yeah. not post not so much the post COVID, but just like in a technology kind of way, like we would do things like we had a day off. We had a Saturday off. And we're like, why are we not playing on Saturday? And, and we were that like, happens a lot. That yeah, happens we were a lot. like maybe a uh, hundred miles from Prague. And we just kind of like two days before the Saturday that we had off, we just put word out and said, Hey, does anyone have a, a venue in Prague? And like, we were able to book a show and get something going on in Prague in two days. And I was like, one of the best shows of the tour. It was like, we were yeah. like, fuck this is so easy like we could have stayed over there and done a couple more weeks just by like reaching out to people on the internet and sort of getting stuff going on in that way it's kind of cool yeah i, prague I mean is great. prague is great i mean uh czech release is the only country that's released and translated all of the books i've ever read written including my cookbook and when i do a show there it's like people bring their kids and then they just stare at my mouth wanting to know every word. It's just, it's a very unique place. Did you spend a lot of time there? Uh, just uh, one day at a time, many days right. over the years. Yeah. I, I I guess the longest I've spent in Prague is about five or six days at a time. And uh, this is like some years ago, cause I had a friend living there and it would be like between tours or whatever. Um, it's kind of interesting because like Czech is the most atheist country in the world. And, and uh, in terms of the tribe and demographics of the Slavs, you know, the, the Polish are right next door and they're the most Catholic in the world. And that's obviously cold war and all, all that stuff. But um, yeah, the, the, the street prostitution and all that stuff on this ancient oh, yeah. kind of museum um, city. It's, it's, it's an interesting place for sure. It's the only really place I've ever seen a granny pickpocketer, which was very interesting to me, right in like the center square. And I mean, like, you know, being at one time, having been a professional pickpocket myself, I know all the signs. I'm like, damn, granny's in a suit and she's pickpocketing. Oh, yeah. Wild. They're still what, open. what about this uh, festival obscene extreme that's in check? That's like a kind of grindcore um some extreme metal and some avant-garde stuff it's every summer it's, it, and it's 
for days and everyone plays it. It's uh well, when I would say Napalm Death and even like the people like Siege who kind of the early plans of that stuff. I, I don't know. Do you know anything about this thing? The obscene extreme? I want in. You want you want to, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure they could hook hey, you up. Hey, stop talking about what we do in our private time. Damn, I'm caught now. Oh, God. So, I, I, no, but so going, going back you to you. A, go ahead, Lydia. Do you have a, did you have a booking agent for your European tours? Did you have to do a lot of it? Yeah, yourself? Like we did one, like, we, this is our second record we put out. And our first record, we went over there for like maybe a couple weeks. And uh, well, anyway, we got we had a new booking agent this time. This woman from uh, Germany, her name was Eula. And she did a pretty good job. We like did crazy, crazy zigzag, like all over the place, like oh. psychotic drives that just didn't make sense. Like all the way up to Edinburgh, then all the way down to Bristol, then all the way yeah. back up to Glasgow, just like crazy. Oh God. Yeah. That's where you got to get a booking agent that's in a band because yeah. otherwise they send you, like they're like armchair, you know, philosophers. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't yeah. care how long. Well, they're, 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 they're chasing, they're chasing the money. And, and they're trying to find the, the, the most money, but they don't realize how that affects the performance when you're really just destroying people in terms of just yeah, exactly uh, lack of sleep. And all Spain? That Wait, was, where was your last stop? Our last thing was Paris, which was crazy. Oh. We stopped in Paris and we were like, we had every intention of like going home the next day and we were all ready to do that. We had discussed it like we could stay in Paris. We're going to end in Paris. Let's just stay there for some days. But we were like, no, we're going to be so over it by that point. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot what we do, like just in terms of like, I mean, we're a couple, you know, yeah. to make all the fucking decisions that we make every single day and do the show. It's kind of it's a lot. It's really taxing. But we we made it work and it, and it worked really well. But we got to Paris and then we were like, I mean, we got there and it was like. Let's not go home. Let's just stay. So we ended up staying like almost two weeks. We just like stayed in Paris. Well, people don't realize what I always say is, yeah, I work nine to five, nine a.m. to five a.m. They don't realize that that mm -hmm. one and a half, one hour on stage, there's eight or ten or twelve other hours that surround it that are, you know, you could be working at McDonald's for the same fucking amount of money by the time you break it down into the time spent in just doing what we do. Yeah, people it's don't realize. It never stops. It's all day long, and the waiting and the just like yeah, just bullshit time mostly waiting know. at the same time i'm really waiting. appreciative i'm really appreciative like yesterday i was in this k-hole yesterday about like you know like all the like we came back and we didn't make very much money you know and i was just like god i just like i feel like i do this so much like so much like giving and working and never get anything i mean but you know i mean that's me like i had super great success with faith no more and stuff and I, I kind of have to like appreciate that, but it's just well, like, you're in good company. Don't worry about it, my friend. You're in good company. We it's just hard, do it. Though, we have know? to I mean, do we it. Work, we work really hard, you know. And you know we have to do it because if we didn't, we'd be even more insane than what we already are. We have to do yeah. it. It's it, if it's not burning in your blood, get off the fucking road. Stay yeah. in the garage. If it burns in your blood, you will take it to the goddamn road because we are road dogs. Yeah. And we can be off the road for a while, but there comes a time you're like, I got to get on the road. But, mm -hmm. you know, you might want to reconsider about two month, two month tours and just think about three weeks at a time. Keep it easy and simple for yourself. Did you really, Lydia, are you guys, um, did you really play your last show? Well, we did for now because I guess, I mean, you know, I got a lot of other things going on and I can't be, and we did every place that we can do. I'm getting back on the spoken word because it's mandatory right now. But also Tim and I do do a let. Kevin Shea and I do something. Matt uh, Nelson, Tim and I do something. Uh, I do the suicide thing. I have a you know a film that I'm just starting to show, Artist Depression, Anxiety, and Rage. I got a lot of things. And Retrovirus was the longest thing I ever did. And it was amazing. It was like the Lydian jukebox. And you know the band was awesome. But... That's, you know, hard to just drag three people around. It's like. I'm all for it, though. I like parameters. I mean, that was really bold when you said that, like, this is our last show. But I like it. It's like exciting. Like, fuck, yeah. Put an end. You got to a million it. other things you to got, do. Yeah, honey, you got a million things it. to do. That's the way I feel, too. Like, I'm not, I'm not scared about ending things. So we, we, as you compare, well, you know, Faith No More was my quote unquote most successful band, you know, I guess financially. And then you compare what what you do now, you know, that's always the, the, in the backdrop. Um, what about fans? 
do people who have no idea what you actually do on your own come with expectations that are just so maybe off the mark? Uh, I mean, what are some of the reactions that some fans uh, have with your other projects? Or is it always usually positive or they're like, what's this? Yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, I mean, honestly, like the demographic of the Faith No More, which is what I'm probably known most for, and a lot of people will come to like shows in England and Europe who are Faith No More fans. And that sort of demographic and those people are for, you know, I don't want to like, you know, generalize, but it's very like angry, aggro, like guy rock sort of thing, you know, and selling them a queer agenda is a little bit of a stretch, you know, but kind of like, I mean, that provocative sense of me sort of like really flares up. And I like like that I'm able to sort of like throw shit in their face that might make them a little bit more uncomfortable. And so that happens, you know, people sometimes like uh, I don't know if they know what they're getting into when they. But, but that's the irony I find is that guy rock fans kind of have man crushes on these rock star guys on stage. And so for them to even be thrown off, it's like kind of they don't have any real perspective of what they've been worshiping. Uh, but. You know, look, the people that need to know who and what you do will find you. That's why we keep doing what we do, because we know there are people that need to hear what we do. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many we know they're out there. And unfortunately, we have to go here, there and the other place just to gather them in spite of the fact that the Internet does exist. But we do have to take it to the road to bring it to the people that actually fucking not only need it, want it, and have to have it. And right. they're out there. And that's why we continue. We're not going to stop. Some of them don't even know they need it, you know? And that's sort of like, that's a neat place to be. Like, I really felt like before we did that tour, we had toured America and we went down to Florida. And Florida is such a weird place right now, you know? Oh, oh yes. it, No, no, it's always been weird. It's yeah, always. I mean, agreed. But like right now, particularly like with like, you know, uh, you know, policies and like oh, the gay awful. issue, it's just like it was so fucked up. And we were driving down there and having conversations like, what the fuck? We're headed into Florida. But then getting there, it's like, oh, no, this is exactly where we need to be. It felt really good. And the crowds were really good. Sure. And really appreciative. And sort of like into it and like grateful that we were there. And it's just like sometimes those things, I mean, that's what I'm finding. Sometimes those situations where it shouldn't work, like Faith No More, like macho dudes coming and expecting one thing and hearing like a gay agenda or like going down to Florida and playing in the midst of like, you know, that crazy fucking state. Sometimes those are just like the sort of heralding, like smart. Exactly. That's why I love places there. like Tennessee. I love to play yeah. in Tennessee. Well, ten Tennessee, places Texas, um, Texas, when, when, Tennessee, when, Florida, when, bring when it people, home, motherfucker. When people yeah. are complacent with having everything uh, provided or worked out for them and their all their comforts are met, there's less rebellion than when uh, people have to fight for what, what they want. And so I, I've at least found just re reiterating what you're saying when you're and in again, a weirdos are everywhere. We are actually we might be a minority, but we are everywhere. We really are. Do Agreed. you play in New York often or where do you like to play in New York? Have you played in New York? Yeah, we played a bunch here. We played like uh, we did a big birthday show. I turned 60 and I did like this crazy show. I was like, OK, I'm turning 60. I'm going to like so I got like a lot of the bands that I play with. I played in this band Imperial Teen and we hadn't played together in like six years. And so we all got together and got a set together. And I play in this other weird band called Nasty Band. Called you what? Guys, like you guys would love Nasty Band. Did this Nasty? Band. Yeah, it's really fucked up. I'm it checking like, that shit. Nasty yeah. Band is like kind of like a more performance thing. And it's like, um, like visually, it's really strong. There's two, there's a set of twins on stage who are usually shirtless. Everyone covers themselves in mud. We have a, uh, we had a singer who was uh, 84 years old, who was <laughs> uh, this awesome, like sound dude. Um, Chris Kachulis was his name. Do you know that guy, Lydia? I don't know him, but I He's want to play with um, Bruce Hack. You know that dude, that noise kind of pioneer dude. Okay. But anyway, he yeah. was our singer, and then we had another guy on stage, my friend Frank, who kind of started the band, who would just like uh, was really dressed up and would just like scream and scream and scream into the mic, but the mic was never on. It was just the visual <laughs> screaming. But it was like this really intense uh, performance thing. But we played also. 
And then Man on Man played also. And then a bunch of friends played. But that was a Bowery Ballroom. That was like a big birthday celebration. That was our last show here in New York. Have you ever played at TBI? No. That's we offered place, a couple of right? times, but it just hasn't worked out. I kind of want to go there. You know who's playing there? I think uh, Voluptuous Horror. Yeah, Cro- canberra has got two shows this weekend. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to go on Saturday. You know. Are you? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll Roddy, see have this. you ever done a spoken word? Because I know you're very political. You're very aware. You know, I try to push everyone. I, on you know, I started, I started writing recently. I've, I've been writing this book for a long time. I can it's, smell it on you. Yeah, <laughs> you can. It's sort of, it's coming out and it's pretty good. But it's funny, like we just brought up, like one time I went to this thing, Kembra was doing this storytelling thing. And I went to that at some club on Lori's side. And I went there and she was like, and I just went there because I was supporting her. I love her. I love what she does. She's like, so you're doing a story, right? And I'd never like done like words like that way. And I, and I go, yeah, sure, of course. And so I just like that night, I just sort of like got on stage and just like went for it, like word wise. Yeah, and it felt really good. I might get back to you on that one, my friend. Now you said, wait, let me go back to what you said. You said you just started writing a book. Is that what you said? Kind of started. I think I'm pretty much finished with it. What about? What is it? Tell. It's kind of like, it's like a memoir sort of thing. It's just like word did and sort of like, kind of tried to steer clear of like, I didn't want to make it any sort of rock memoir sort of vibe, but it kind of like more, it's sort of like the testament of like a kid, like coming to terms with like queerness in that realm when queer was- Are more important than a rock memoir. Yeah, it feels more poetic and I don't know, that's where I sort of went with it. It, I I, I like what I've written, but I just haven't sort of- Well, you know what? You can always come over to my house for a spoken word workshop one-on-one. That sounds cool. (laughs) <laughs> you do those i do well i usually i don't do them privately but in your case i will yeah yes well it's all, there's do, there's always a little workshop overtone when you go over her house there's I, I, things I are being worked out word. i do do spoken word workshops because it's very important for people to get on the stage and tell their real life stories i usually do it for women but in your case since both of us they can't define what we are by any convenient terms I think you need to come over, my friend. That Bring that good. book. Bring that book. I will yeah. put that ass on the stage. Well, the two of you oh, have a lot of a lot of mutual friends. Uh, it turns out, in fact, I, I think I got your contact through a mutual friend. Uh, but I, yeah, did you ever run into each other besides being in the same room at, at the same show, whether one's performing? Did you guys ever have a longer conversation? Years no, in the we just ran in ran, quick run in. I think that was at St. Vitus. The last time. St. Vitus, but you know, Lydia, one time, like oh, that night I didn't see, I didn't meet you at the 1313 show, but um, there was this weird show that you played. I think it was with Wet Retrovirus, which was like, I want to say it was like a t-shirt show. Does that make sense? You know, Caesar? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The fashion you thing. Made this, like, um, it was like a, I think you made a book of like old vintage rock t-shirts he did and i wrote the intro yes yeah and there was a performance thing after and i think i don't know what i did but you were there and you performed for sure and we met that that night we met in los angeles yes i do remember it was at the fashion institute or something yeah 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 outside but we got more things to discuss privately especially that book that you're sitting on because i can't wait for that I am a huge fan of personal memoirs and rock memoirs, but we, you know, who, who, the journalist can write the rock memoirs. We need to write the real life memoirs. That's what's important. Yeah, I'd love you to read it. I would that love to. Fun. I would love. I would love for you to come over, read it to me, and I'll read it back to you. That sounds. That's how you hear what you got written. Lydia, do you ever know that woman, Michelle T? Are you a fan of hers? Yeah, I know Michelle T, the poet. Yes, she's a. Cool she was out of the East Bay, right? Out of yeah. out of yeah. I was just reading one of her books. People kept talking about it. I've heard about her forever and I never read her. But just last week, I started reading one of her books. She's such a strong writer. She's very good. We got to support. I think, you know, writing still, writing and spoken word. It's why I have to, well, I never get out of it. I'm always in it. But I, I do like to cattle prod other people out of the stage. So watch your ass because it will be poked soon. I'd love to be prodded in that way. I Mike need- Mike uh, Hoffman is uh, texting me right now. Who oh, do you know? Mike, you know Mike Hoffman. You of friends he knows of Mike yes, Hoffman. yes. 
His name sounds familiar. Who's Mike? Caesar, 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 Surfer Mike from LA. Surfer, Surfer Mike from LA. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know Mike. He's, 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 my house tonight. he's in town for five days right now. In fact, he, he'll probably come to the uh, camera show on Saturday as well. Ooh, is he around for Christmas Eve? Y- yes. yes. Wow, awesome. I'm having a party. You guys should come over for Christmas Eve. I'm having a party. Over I'm, here. I'm having a party too. Oh, where, oh, do no. you live? Where, where do you live? I live West Village. What, you, you, can tell, you can tell me later. <laughs> yeah, come over. You're also Scott. You're having a party, Tim. Tim, well, I, I, I'm I'm having I, I'm having no worries. I'm having um just like a, a small dinner thing, like like eight people kind of thing. It's not like a, a rager, just but 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 we we do kind of go a little nuts. Roddy, we're gonna, gonna have our own. Roddy, we're yeah, gonna have our own party, good. honey. Yeah, we are. We're gonna have our own spoken word party. Trust me on that. Real quickly though, I just want to touch on what year did you move to New York? Um, I think 2009. Okay. All right. It would inspire that. Uh, a lover. A, a, a... So, you know, I was like living in Los Angeles for a long time and I was doing like film score stuff after Faith No More broke up. And I thought like, that's what I really wanted to do. And I kind of did like doing it. It was kind of fun. But like at the end of the day, it just wasn't really floating my boat. It's like, it's kind of like, like I had a little bit of success, not a lot, but I was like getting somewhere with it. And it just felt like at one point it was like, this is not what I want to be known for. And also, Roddy, it, it t- correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with something like man on man, I mean, words are important to you. you got to get these astute messages out there. you got to yeah. say these songs. You've yeah. got to be saying these words. Yeah, that was my deal. I just felt like, like, yeah, I should like, I don't want to be sprinkling music on the end of somebody's little project, which is cool. Like, I think it can work and it can be fun. But at the same time, I was like, I got it in my head that I wanted to write an opera. So I really like then I decided like, okay, well, if I'm going to do that, then I'm (laughs) I'm going to move to New York because that's where operas are made. Sure. I came to New York with that intention. So I came and I wrote an opera in New York and that kind of started my stay. here. I'm so happy to have been talking with you, my friend. Yeah, it's a fun chat. We got more to discuss. That I trust called me. You Scott, that was a major faux pas. No, that's fine. It's fine. It's okay. We, we got. More I, I, you know that that's a, that's the first Scott I've ever gotten. I, I, I've, God, never, I I've, like never, I've never. I've never heard it. To me, <laughs> those two names are the same. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be little. No, 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 no. It's fine. It's <laughs> funny because cool sing, single syllable names are interesting. But in Japan, uh, I, I was uh, hanging out with this woman once. And, I, and she's like, I was like, we're talking about single syllable names. And she's like, no, your name's five sil- syllables. Like, what? She goes, team. And I was like, I mean, so, so the way, they, Don't make me the sing way she the hears song. that is five fucking syllables. Like, whoa, that's Damn a very good thing. Don't make me sing the song. Anyway, Rod, thank you very much. This is the Lydian spin, as it always is with Lydia Lunge. Timothy, a.k.a. Scott Dahl <laughs> and Roddy Bottoms. Uh, I will Bottom, bottom. bottom. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. That was yes, fun. Yes, it was.